Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I think that is an incredibly common trend in the United States as well. Like we just don't travel as well as, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you, and, and part of that's proximity. I mean, it's really like living in, in Europe is just so good because everything's so close. So mm-hmm. and like flights are so chill. Like we flew to, we spent two weeks in Iceland in February and it cost us like 55 pounds round trip to, mm-hmm. to, you know, fly from Edinburgh. And it was, you know, it's, it's just very different, I think, culturally very different as well. Yeah. So was there a terminal point for the journey or did it, were you just like, okay, I've done seven continents, so it's over or, or does that itch still there? Uh, yeah, no, it's still there. It's always, you know, pl- planning the next thing. And, you know, when I, so th- it was like, I always had it, the next thing relatively planned until, um, in, until I finished the AT. Cause it was, I finished the continents in December, 2017, and I had already planned to through hike the AT in 2018. And then it was like, after the AT, I wasn't quite sure what was next. And that was why I, I decided to go to Scotland. It was, uh, Fiona and, and Tom came and hiked a week with me on the AT. And he mm-hmm. was like, oh, well, if you don't know kind of what, what's next for you, why don't you come to Scotland for a little bit? And I was going to go for, you know, two, three weeks. I was doing two races there. I was doing a race in a marathon in Scotland and then a marathon in Ireland. And then I ended up staying for like three months. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's part of the nice thing about being really flexible with plants and stuff like that. But, you know, it, it'll always be there. I think it's, you know, it's like racing. It's like once you have a taste for it, you're just not going to stop until like, you physically can't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's always something bigger, something further uh, out there. And, yeah, I have a, you know, I have a list a mile long on my phone of, of stuff that I want to do and, and stuff that I need to get out and do. But that's what I think is so important about just taking the time to do it while you can. Cause you, especially, you know, I've, I've been lucky in a sense to, to get this perspective from working in emergency medicine for the last six years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you know, people that I see come to the hospital, people that call 911, you, you never expect that you don't wake up in the morning and say that these things are going to happen to you. Right. And, you know, while, while your body is physically able to do it, you know, you, you just got to do it. You got to figure out, you know, that you can always make an excuse not to do something because you don't want to mm-hmm. spend the money or you don't have the time for it. Uh, but, you know, one day you're not going to be able to. And that's scared. That's what scares me. Yeah. Uh, but. Yeah, no, it's so it's it seems like it's kind of died down a little bit, but it definitely for. Um, so I graduated college in 2011 um, and then for a, a little bit before. Before I graduated college, probably when I entered 2007, 2005, I'm trying to think when the four hour work week came out. But for, I would say, at least a good decade, like, and it's still alive, but the whole like lifestyle of being like a digital nomad and like trying to be more flexible with life so you can travel more, like, really blossomed as like kind of, you know, you're younger than me, but we're not that disparate in ages. No. Um, like, as we're coming of age, like, that whole idea really bloomed up with you know us growing up basically and kind of i felt like in some ways that was like our generation's rebellion against like materialistic desires and be like no i want to go out and travel and see the world and meet people and and do these things while like you said while i have the opportunity I, i think a lot of us stare at you know the possibility of so the traditional path where it's like okay you get a job you work for 30 40 years and then you're 65 and you retire it's like okay i'm 65 i'm 300 pounds because i sat at a desk and ate cookies all day right. <laughs> now i can't actually go do those things anymore so i'm you know being ridiculous a little bit but just there's so much happens like you said that you see firsthand between 20 and 65 that it's like take the opportunity while you have it because you Absolutely. don't know what's happening tomorrow. Yeah, and I think that that's where you know our generation you know changed a lot from our parents who you know I like you know my mom and dad. It was when they you know were eighteen they got a job and that mm-hmm. was their job until you know they retired. And but for me and you know I inadvertently discovered this travel because of you know the events that happened in my life. I'm you know I'm really glad it did because you know I I definitely would have. I think stayed on that traditional path of, you know, getting into a career, you know, taking the, the two week vacation once a year, maybe, and then getting to be 65 and then, you know, 
that's the, that's the thing. It's like, I knew that when I retired, I couldn't go, you know, to some, you know, cr- really remote place in the world and run a hundred K. It's just not mm-hmm. do I needed to do that when I'm in you know, my twenties or my thirties. It's just not, you know, I wanted to do it when my body was able to function and, and see these places and experience them how I wanted to. Yeah. Well, and for you listening, um, it, it's not to disparage a traditional path because I'm even probably more right. so on that now running a couple of businesses where well, I'm pretty tied down, but, it, but I, I don't want to speak for you, Bobby, but I guess the point I'm trying to get across is that like forcibly disrupting your own routine to have an adventure at some point in time helps make you a more interesting person, which in turn, I think helps make you happier. Absolutely. And I get, yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, and it, it's a thing too, where the grass is always greener. You know, right. I look at some, some of my friends who have, you know, really stable lives and, and pretty solid bank accounts and I'm like, Oh, you know, that, that would be pretty nice to, to have some normalcy to yeah. it all. But, but then and they look at some of the stuff that I've done and they wish that they could, could get away. And, you know, it's a matter of finding balance, I think at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, funny, I, so I mentioned uh, Mike earlier, Mike Hagedone, and, and the big message that, like, he talked about and we talked about was basically just, like, gratitude and being grateful for, like, the things you have or the you know, the people that are in your life or whatever it is that is present with you now. Um, and I, I, I can't remember who it is. I think it's Ezra Firestone, who's, a like, a, a, a business guy, an entrepreneur. Um, he was talking about he's big on gratitude and his point was basically if you can't be grateful for what you have now, no matter how much you have, you won't be satisfied. Right. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, no, it's very true. Yeah. So it's just like trying to figure out, you know, what's important to you versus saying, you know, I wish I'd lived Bobby's life or, you know, you saying, oh, maybe I should have done something more normal. It's like we all have different opportunities and different experiences, which we can share through with each other. But like as long as we can be grateful for where we are and then also continue to set our sights ahead, like I think that's the best that we can we can do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, if I could change one thing about, you know, society as a whole is that you know, it's just especially, you know, social media amplifies this to an extreme, but we just live in such a comparative and competitive mm-hmm. society. And I think that, you know, not to be cliche about it, but you have to have your own journey and you have to be ultimately satisfied with that. And, you know, we look at, you know, comparing ourselves to people, you see that in a really negative sense as well, where I, you know, I try to talk about this when, when I'm speaking to people about mental health and that, you know, that's the biggest thing I try to get across my book because I want to help people with mental health. And that's kind of the, the hot topic at the moment Yeah. that, you know, after the Boston Marathon happened, you know, I didn't feel like I had the right or I deserved to, to be depressed because I had, you know, compared to other people had gotten away pretty clean with it. You know, no one in my family had died and mm-hmm. I had all my limbs. So, you know, I was ashamed and embarrassed to even talk about the things that I was feeling because mm-hmm. I was comparing to someone that, someone else. And, you know, if anyone's listening or anyone, you know, that reads the book, you know, just because you think that someone has gone through something worse or more traumatic than you doesn't devalue what you've gone through. And I think right. that's such an important message to get across because the worst thing that's happened to you is the worst thing and that's it you don't you don't need to compare it to anyone else right and you deserve to to feel and experience everything that you have that comes with that right there's, there's kind of like um almost a culture of it in, in he talks about it in a different sense uh, i think in one of not maybe not the best example but dave Chappelle has a has a bit where he's talking it's not I know this isn't even the comedy part but he starts talking about like how essentially if i remember right invalid comparative suffering is where it's like Mm. i suffer you suffer you don't need to compare them we're both suffering right you know like it's not a contest of who suffered more you're you're both suffering you both need to be healed and go on your own journey to become better you don't have to be like well i suffer more so i need the attention you know right right it's not a matter of triage in in everyday life (laughs) yeah yeah so, um, I do want to know a little bit about logistics and I, I, you know, I'm, 
trying to dance around in the book a little bit. Obviously, I haven't read it yet, or at least it looks like it's still pre-order as we're doing this, so I don't haven't had a copy of it. Yeah, it should um, be out. Should be out now. I know, okay, I know you can you can get it on Amazon at the moment. Okay, okay, that that's. I meant to ask you that for, before we got going, and then we got going. But because I because when I went to the the sales page, it still said like pre-order now. So I was like, okay. Okay. Um, uh, but so I, I don't want to like have you be like, well, this is what happens in this chapter, that kind of thing. But I do want a little bit of logistics. I'm logistically mm. curious about uh, Antarctica and how that worked. Yeah, Antarctica was cool um, for, for sure. I did it with a, um, a company called uh, Marathon Adventures. I think they're based out of Minnesota, but a guy named Steve Hibbs, he's awesome. Hi- highly recommend them if you want to go do Antarctica. Um, it, especially it, it was different for me because I wasn't massively keen on, on doing like the marathon tourism. Like, like mm-hmm. for me, it was mostly, I was going and doing my own thing and figuring mm-hmm. out how to get to these races. Obviously Antarctica isn't one that you can do that for, um, right. you, you need, you need a company cause you need a, w- a way to get there really. Mm-hmm. Um, so Antarctica was my, it's funny because it was my most expensive, um, but also my shortest trip doing any of these like all the other races i was i was gone for you know three four months i think i was gone for two weeks for this and it was actually just after my winter break during my senior year of college Mm -hmm. um so basically you go to uh with this company you go to chile you go to um, punta arenas so southern southern tip of chile and then you wait there for uh however long it takes to get a weather window for you to be able to fly to antarctica so this race was on king george island so just northwest um, off the coast, Antarctica there. And we were relatively lucky. We got a window kind of in the first, uh, I think it was like the second or third day that, that we were, we were kind of aiming for. And you basically just need enough visibility, low winds and, you know, uh, a, a clear enough runway, you know, which is, you know, gravel, sand, ice. It's not right. you know, an, an, an airport by any means. Um, and it was, it was really loops. Um, but the, the best part about it was, um, penguins like it was mm-hmm. one of the, the coolest things to be you know running running around and it, it, it's exciting at first you know seeing a wild penguin for the first time mm-hmm. and then it and then it gets frustrating because they're so curious because they don't have tons and tons of human interaction so when right. i think about you know growing up in new england and you know every animal is so skittish or there's you know deer squirrels chipmunks they'll, yeah. they'll always run away but penguins will run towards you so it's really fun at first you're getting this really close interaction with these really amazing animals and then, you know, after an hour, two hours of running and you're, you're trying to maneuver through the snow and, and you're breaking trail in some places. And then you're trying to have to, to get around the penguins and it becomes kind of this game a, a little yeah. bit. So, so, so it is interesting from that aspect as well. And yeah, it's just nice to see some places that are still relatively untouched um, by people. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly trying to find places that are like that. Yeah, well... <laughs> God, I can't remember. I mean, this is this is is some dumb TV show, I'm sure, but it's like uh, the sentiment that basically we are born too late to live in the age of adventure, as it the planet's basically populated by people, you know, but too early to live in the age of space exploration. So yeah. we're like in this middle zone where we there's not really uncharted territories for the most part for us to go unless we're gonna like start specializing in like super deep sea diving or something right, right. so uh, yeah i was curious about the penguins just because i was like if they're hanging out and i didn't know about, about them running towards you but i'm like i could just imagine you know they're animals like they're not going to be like hey there's a path here so i should stay off of it I, they may just sit there if they want to sit there so it's like are right. you trying to like hurdle penguins while you're <laughs> while you're trying to run a marathon yeah yeah so i mean it was cool and you know those are the things that i look back on and you know i've been in- incredibly lucky to to go to and have run in some of the places i have and, and it's those kind of funny moments like that 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 you really cherish i feel like that's a you could be playing like going to going to a party and telling it's uh, starting with uh like icebreaker two truths and a lie and you could just add things like i once ran with a penguin and like just just some like nonsensical things and people would be like it was definitely the penguin one. He wasn't running with penguins. Like, no, that was that was the true one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I've definitely definitely had some good experiences, and you know, I, I always um, you know credit my parents for it as well because it was I I grew up you know always you know what my parents said that was it, 
and mm-hmm. I, you know, I respect my parents enough that if when I started doing this, if they said, you know, that's crazy, you shouldn't be traveling there, or you shouldn't be spending the money on this, or you shouldn't be running in that place, I just wouldn't have done it. Like it, it, it's another thing that would have changed everything. But the whole time, they, it is crazy and outlandish. Is some of the things that I've done where they, oh, even if they didn't agree with it, they supported my decision making in it. Mm-hmm. Have you seen your like? Have you seen your relationship change with them because of the journey? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, especially with, um, you know, my mom, who was just, she, we always kind of say that she is the most overprotective mom in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think she has definitely learned to compromise on, on certain things and realize that in, in her own way that the world isn't as big, a bad, scary a place because mm-hmm. of, you know, some of the things that I've gone or some of the things that I've related back to her. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you mentioned earlier like the the admonition that a lot of parents give to kids about don't talk to strangers mm. or you know like I grew up in martial arts and there's stranger danger <laughs> right you know but it's almost like okay you need to be able to like be street smart and know about a dangerous situation but otherwise it's almost like well, yeah talk to strangers so trying to take that advice and change it into something more reasonable, do you, like, how would you change that phrase or, like, how would you change that lesson, um, you know, if you had kids and you're trying to teach them about, like, your new approach? How would you change How would you change that sentiment? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's important to be cautious. And especially to, you know, this isn't, you know, applicable to, you know, seven, eight, nine-year-old kids. Where it's right. Like, you know, where it's like, yeah, go go talk to strangers. Like, go, go out and, you know, find a van. And, you know, it, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> right. Um, I, you know, I, if I were to change it, it would be, you know, be cautious, but don't be so cautious that, that you shut yourself off from opportunities. Because, you know, the, the thing that, that made my journey happen was being open to opportunities. Because I, when I look back at everything, you know, it, it was because I said yes to certain things. And I, I've never regretted saying yes to, you know, someone I- inviting me on a trip or to do something within a trip. But, you know, I've, I've can think of, you know, 10 things off the top of my head right now that I've regretted saying no to. Yeah. Um, so so it, it's being able to, to have the common sense to, to see when you should do things. Yeah, that's, that's a, a kind of a sentiment I've tried to use when I travel is just like, say yes. That That's the simplest thing, at least I've found, that's the simplest thing you can do to get outside of your comfort zone without effort. You know, right. just like see something, just say yes. Like you'll find yourself outside of your comfort zone, right. navigating new situations and, you know, having experiences you wouldn't have otherwise because maybe you're afraid or, you don't you think you don't like it or you don't normally like it or whatever it's like well, maybe that new situation will bring new insight that you wouldn't have had otherwise absolutely and i think that's so applicable to you know the racing community as well yeah. it's like, like you know it you've whether it's like doing you know making the jump from marathon to 50k or something mm-hmm. like that you know it, you're very reluctant to do it and then you know, you don't regret saying yes once you've done it, you know, mm-hmm. or maybe it's, you know, especially like in ultras, maybe it is that like type two fun uh, yeah. a bit of it. But, you know, I remember in South America going back and forth, arguing with my friend Joe that I was with, who I was going to run the race with, whether it was we were going to run, um, you know, the 80K or the 50K. And we had done, you know, like 60, 70 miles of trekking just before that in Patagonia. And I was like, oh, I really don't know if I want to run. 80k yeah she's like no 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 we gotta do it we gotta do it we gotta do it I'm like, all, right, all right like fine we'll do it and you know i'm so glad we did um and it's just those things because you know a lot of the things that i have the best memories with or the you know the most memorable experiences were things that i was reluctant to do but i i decided to do it i think it's good good uh note to start wrapping up on um so this year i'm asking everybody the same question because this is kind of a universal but always ends up being a little bit different and it's particularly poignant with you given the book um so i'm asking everybody what do you think the purpose of sport is the purpose of sport yeah i think it, this is kind of an, an interesting time to to ask that as well because mm-hmm. we're seeing kind of how how the world is uh is without sports right. and and i think it's making us realize 
the, the importance of sport beyond competition because it, it really is we seek sport for inspiration we seek it for human interaction for relatability and, and mm-hmm. it's so much more than than you know a, a time or a, a point total at, at the end of the day and i think that sport in its own right is one of the important most important parts of community and i think a lot of us are anxiously awaiting for it to be back yeah <laughs> yeah I, yeah we definitely have our own rituals around sport and getting together for games and that whole thing here so i know we'll be ready for at least a uh, soccer season to start again mm-hmm. and you know doing everything around soccer season so um bobby if people want to get the book if people want to see what you're up to where can they get the book uh where can they keep up with you yeah so on amazon uh, it's Running Wild book. You might have put my name, Running Wild, Bobby O'Donnell. Uh, it's also on my publisher's website, Mascot Books. Um, so it'll be on those two places. I have a website, runningwildbook.com, and it's at Running Wild on Instagram. Sounds good. Thanks for spending some time with me today, Bobby. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me, Jesse. It was great. Take care.